AI is changing the internet. Get ready for more walled gardens. Motley Fool Money starts now. I'm Dylan Lewis, and I'm joined over the airwaves by Motley Fool analyst Asit Sharma. Asit, thank you so much for joining me today. Dylan, I appreciate you having me. Well, we are kicking off the second half of 2023 talking about social media properties and the state of the internet. And Asit, part of the reason for that is over the holiday weekend, Twitter made some adjustments. Uh, Users were seeing that they had to be logged in in order to see tweets. And the company was also limiting the number of posts that users could view in a day. This rate limiting that we're seeing is supposed to be temporary, but it seems to be in direct response to increased data scraping that we're seeing from AI companies. Yeah, Dylan, this is something that Elon Musk has talked about. He's concerned that uh, companies can take Twitter's valuable public data for free and repurpose it, commercialize it. Now, we don't know exactly why. Twitter kicked this stuff in over a holiday weekend. There are a bunch of theories around, one being that maybe they didn't pay their cloud bills. <laughs> I mean, they haven't paid rent uh, on their San Francisco properties. Maybe they have by now, but they didn't for months after Elon Musk took over. Other theories uh, abounded over the weekend. But on a more serious level, generally what you're saying is a concern of, of Twitter's, the management team. And I think this is something that has larger implications for use in the internet. We've become quite used to being able to freely move around, post information, grab information as a society. So what works in in this type of world has also worked in terms of business monetization. That may be changing. Something that's kind of interesting with this asset is Twitter was kind of the outlier in social media for a while with how open and accessible a lot of its content was. Uh, this seems like a big step if they do wind up going in this direction of making it a little bit more difficult or having to be logged in and this sticks. But this is something that Instagram has done. This is something that Facebook has done. It's just we've kind of used Twitter as this uh, global town square for such a long time that to see anything interrupt that is is a little bit of a surprise, I think, for people. I think it makes us realize that this coming wave of AI content has more serious implications. It's coming faster than we expected. I myself, you know, as you do, Dylan, spend a lot of time studying the impact of AI on business and society. But th- these moves are sort of accelerating. And they're making us rethink, you know, what the nature of content is. I'll give you just one example. You know, that's come to my mind. We use memes all the time as a society. There's a content somebody puts out there, maybe from a film or a commercial. We grab it. We make a meme out of that. We pass that around. We repurpose that in platforms like TikTok, which then make money off of memes that are incorporated into short form content. So it's been a freewheeling space. Uh, for some time. Twitter has been, as you point out, one of the platforms that has enabled us to have this sort of freewheeling of exchange of ideas, content, some of it commercial, some of it just silly. What is it going to look like in the future? I think Musk also pointed out that, frankly, Twitter has to foot the bill for bandwidth that is driven by some of the scraping activity and bot activity that's happening. And he doesn't really want to do that anymore. And we're seeing a similar dynamic play out with Reddit. Uh, This isn't really a platform that we talk about all that much because they're not publicly traded yet, but they are kind of colloquially known as the front page of the internet. And they aggregate news, content, community posts, and they announced plans to charge for their API access earlier this year. Those changes are slated to go into effect this summer. This dynamic is similar, where uh, there are a lot of third-party Reddit apps that access the company's API, and leadership from the company has said, we have a lot of value here in what we're providing, and frankly, we're not too keen on giving it away to some of the world's largest companies, Asset. So strange, because Reddit at one time felt very much like this sort of renegade source of information as it's matured, it also has to look at these same issues. How do we make a profit? How do we keep the the lights on here? The solution that Steve Huffman has, the CEO, is to go public. And there's been a lot of friction 
between some of these third parties uh, and Reddit and users of the platform, those who supply information to the platform. Uh, I read in something you shared with me, Dylan, that users are like, okay, w we sort of get that, but how did you, you know, get all this content? Someone provided that. <laughs> you know, do we get paid as well when you guys go public? So the questions keep abounding. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's the nature of being a user-generated platform, right? Is you're not paying the people who are providing it. Uh, at what point does there need to be profit sharing there as well? All to say, Asit, we are seeing kind of a lot of challenging of conventional wisdom when it comes to the way that the internet and a lot of internet properties have operated over the last 10 to 15 years. And it seems to me like one of the biggest reasons for it is we see so much scraping activity and so much bot activity tied to artificial intelligence. And the future of how these platforms will monetize is probably going to be very highly influenced by companies like OpenAI and developments in artificial intelligence. Yeah, Dylan, you were sharing with me your thoughts on uh, OpenAI's, the, the, the owner of ChatGPT's expo exposure to lawsuits. Uh, they're ha having some class action lawsuits that they're facing now because they've scraped data. But it's so interesting, you know, we should point out that this didn't start from a mercenary point at all. These large language models are largely self-taught in their architecture. So in 2017, a research paper at Google pointed out there was a different way to utilize neural networks to be able to start making connections in a much more rapid fashion than the current existing neural networks made. Since that time, those models have been shown to get better the more data you feed them. The more context you give what's called the transformer model, the better it can make uh, different relationships, and the better it is at being conversational, at making lists, at roasting you if you ask it to, to roast you on a topic. That all comes from a good place, the massive amount of data that needed or were needed for us to make this seminal leap that brought ChatGPT and, and other models onto the scene. Now that we're here, though, what about that data? I mean, whose data is it? Did you pay for it? Do you have rights to it? We see some companies like Adobe, for example, openly saying, look, we're just going to use our database of images that we've paid for and built over our existence as a public company. So if you use our services for, let's say, uh, generative AI-based art, you're not going to have to worry if you're a company. We're not going to be exposed to lawsuits because we're using our, our own stuff. This is where it starts to get complicated for businesses who want to use these large language models, but are worrying about the ground they're treading on. Are they going to have exposure later on if they're using ChatGPT because the lawsuits go past open AI to these enterprise businesses? Asit, as you're looking at exposure companies may have to this, you talked a little bit about IP there, and it seems to me like companies that own IP, whether it's their own or user-generated on their platform, which they then kind of own too, they are in a position uh, to be fairly okay. We have, for a very long time, looked at companies and said, you know, they're able to drive a lot of organic traffic by way of SEO, or they're able to maintain really good paid marketing channels on places like Facebook and Instagram. How are you thinking about exposure with AI for companies and also the way that it may affect how people are able to drive users to their sites or business to e-commerce platforms? Yeah, Dylan, it might have something to do in the way you kicked us off. I mean, maybe the walled gardens get stronger. As a consumer, I, I sort of hate to see that. Even Wikipedia is starting to wonder, how are we going to keep moderating our content we're inevitably going to start getting AI-generated submissions. How do we deal with that? Now, that's not a site that's monetized, but it does hit you up. If, if you use Wikipedia, uh, as I do, we'll hit you up for donations. They need money to survive, too. That's an example of a company, a nonprofit, that's going to sort of struggle to understand how it can deal with this. But let's look at the other side of it, a monetized company that is a walled garden, like Meta. They have their own ecosystem. They've developed a lot of IP internally. They've got content that users generate, and they can draw advertisers. Does that mean that those walls get thicker and thicker? 
And those few of us who are out there in the real world, meekly searching for information, it gets harder and harder for us to find uh, information that we don't have to pay for. I will say, it, I've seen more and more sites throwing up paywalls over the last few years, but it seems to have almost accelerated a bit since ChatGPT burst on the, the scene. I don't know if that's been your experience as you browse around. Yeah, I've been seeing the same thing, especially with a lot of news and information sites. And I wasn't sure if that was just, you know, the the pinch of, you know, we're seeing advertiser spend go down and they're looking to drive up the subscriber numbers, or if that was AI driven. I could see a little bit of both there, Asset. That they would kind of both make sense to me as explanations. You mentioned meta there, Asset, and one thing that uh, may affect the trajectory of some of these decisions is their recent entrance uh, into the microblogging space. Tomorrow, uh, July sixth. Uh, Meta is set to unveil its Twitter competitor, Threads. And this is something that is not all that surprising. If you followed Meta, the company, uh, they have a long history of taking things that work at other internet properties and deciding to adopt it and try their own version of it. Um, given everything that's going on and kind of the unrest right now in, in social media, do you think that this new offering, uh, as an extension of Instagram, maybe something that can take a bite out of some of Twitter's business? I think it can, Dylan. Uh, maybe over time, it won't be overnight that uh, Twitter's users abandoned the platform in droves. I mean, they have been abandoning the platform, but it's been incremental at this point. Twitter users are a very loyal lot. They, they like the platform. They wish that all of the instability that uh, Elon Musk brought about when he bought the platform just didn't exist. They want the old sort of stable ex user experience back, but we see they're willing to to try. They're, they've jumped onto other smaller platforms. I feel that the larger active user base uh, that Instagram has is going to be a key factor. Now, there are different ways to to look at traffic, so I'm going to just cite one source. This is Similar Web. You can go check out Similar Web when you want to see how traffic is climbing or rising on different sites. Uh, for the last report I read. I think this is stats for uh, April. Instagram had 889 million monthly active users versus about 213 million for Twitter. Now, we know Twitter users can be more active in a given month, but you see the, the difference in these uh, platforms, the sizes. And similar web says that Twitter lost about 7.6% of its traffic year over year. That's because of all the uncertainty. You don't know when you open up Twitter if you're going to have to log on to see views, right? So, um, this is something that makes me think there's an opening here for a company like Meta. Also, the early stuff we've seen on threads, for those of you who go out on tech sites indicates that this project might be part of something called the Fediverse, which means that they're going to be interoperable between sites like Mastodon or Blue Sky. You could have an identity on threads and message with people who are on these other platforms. I don't know about Twitter. That's going to attract users as well. When you put all this together, if you think of advertisers where they want to be, they want to be on stable platforms where they don't have to worry if someone can log on to, to view the content, they're already spending money on Meta's properties. I mean, they're already there on Instagram. So, this is maybe a natural opening that seems like it could be an also ran, but it could end up being one of these properties you know, that, that Meta trots out and, and makes stronger uh, in, a, in a short period of time. Asad, as we potentially move to a spot where we're a little bit less open with the internet and we're looking at a little bit more of walled garden type properties, do you think that that tends to benefit larger companies that already have these installed bases and can roll kind of lookalike apps out there, maybe making it a little bit harder for some people to start as an upstart in those spaces? Yeah, unfortunately, it certainly looks like that, especially we'll stay on the case of Meta. They've got experience with this, right? They've, they've done this with several lookalike uh, platforms. They know how to adapt uh, a, a platform so they don't get sued <laughs> for the look and feel of it. They already have experience in creating a backend that fits into their existing infrastructure, their, their backend servers. So it's not that difficult for Meta to create a threads in a short amount of time. When you've got capital, when you've got a lot of cloud access, when you've got teams of engineers, and you already have policies in place for content moderation. And this is an important distinction here. Meta 
hasn't done the best job of content moderation over the years when you think about Facebook's struggles with privacy, but they do have infrastructure there. Elon Musk got rid of most of his content moderation <laughs> that existed over at Twitter, and they're, they're suffering for it. So, when you've got the parts and pieces sort of ready to roll in cookie cutter fashion, yeah, you can spend a few hundred million to create a competitor, and that benefits those companies with the means. It makes it harder then in turn for smaller startups with a beautiful idea to give users an alternative to a, a service like Twitter. Well, threads might wind up being cheaper than the metaverse ambitions at a couple hundred million dollars. <laughs> Asset. Wow, uh, guess. <laughs> <laughs> which I think uh, a lot of meta shareholders would be would be happy to see. Asset, thanks so much for hopping on today and talking through this internet stuff with me. Yes, it's a lot of fun, Dylan. Thanks a lot. Coming up, we're putting our money where our mouth is. Nick Seipel joins Ricky Mulvey to share three stocks he recently bought. Nick Seipel, this is a pretty simple segment. It's just called Stocks We Recently Bought, and we talk about some stocks that we recently bought. The first one you sent over was one that I hadn't heard of before, so I wanted to make sure we got to it. It's called Evelis, which is a multi-product aesthetics company they got a product that can maybe help you look a little bit younger. But first, let's set the table of what medical aesthetics is and maybe the market opportunity for Evolus. Sure. Medical aesthetics, uh, as it sounds, these are, are medical products that, that help make your appearance improve. So, smooth lines and frankles, plump up your lips, all the great things that make us look younger, prettier, and better on Instagram. Um, this is a $9 billion market, and the biggest chunks of that market are injectable neurotoxins. Think about your Botox out there in the world, and also dermal fillers. Um, those make up um, about half of the value of, of the market. That market is growing at a mid teen rate and is expected to continue growing at a similar rate far into the future. Again, I mentioned the Instagram effect. Lots more interest in some of these products among the millennial generation than there have been among prior generations. This is a this is a category that's really only about twenty years old. Botox as a as a, a drug for things like migraines and things like that had been around for decades beforehand, but but as a, an aesthetic application, really only been around since since the early two thousands. Where does Juvo? Uh, excuse me. Where does Evelis stand out? Their their lead product is known as Juvo. It's a it's a competitor uh, for Botox and a, a, an aesthetic neuro toxin product. Uh, interesting for a couple reasons. One, uh, as in terms of the size of the molecule, pretty much identical to the Botox product. Uh, there's actually some litigation around that a couple of years ago that was settled. And now, company moving forward today also differentiated in the market. It, 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 in addition to being a product very similar, applied in a very similar way, has been tested one for one against Botox. It also has a different go to market approach than other folks on the market, whereas everybody else on the market has both a, a medical application. So, think, again, think things like my migraines and things like that, and also use the same drug for an aesthetic application. Evolus is a cash pay aesthetic only company, which allows them significantly more flexibility in pricing and marketing relative to other folks that take insurance payments. So that's going to allow Evolus, I think, to grow at a faster rate than uh, a market that, again, is already growing at a mid-teens rate, that the product, post some of those litigation issues, has gone back out of the market over the past couple of years, has surged to 10% market share, and I think they can go um, even higher. So, they can lean into that Instagram effect marketing maybe a little bit more than their competitors. This company is not profitable on an operating basis, though. What needs to go right for Evolus to get there? Yeah, I think I think the story is continuing to reach scale and and gain share in the existing market. Uh, again, Juvo, I think they're they're over one million membership members in their um in their loyalty program. Again, need to continue to see the company uh, reach scale in order to reach profitability. Another thing that that's worth noting for the company is just in the last month or so, they've expanded beyond their single product focus with Juvo and now plan to enter into the dermal filler market over the next several years. They signed an agreement um, with Cymatees, which has been an effective uh, uh, manufacturer of fillers in the past, have a, have a product um, um, on the market uh, today uh, known as Restylane. That's one of the two, top two competitors in the market. They're going to have a co-branded product with Evolis called Evolise that they expect uh, to get onto the market in 2025. So, you look at their, their long-term guidance, which they put out um, 
which they put out back in May. They expect uh, their revenue to reach $700 million by the year 2028, which would be a 29% compound annual growth rate. If they're able to execute on that, uh, management expects that they should reach cash flow break even here in the next couple of years, and then you know, smooth sailing from there. Wait, what's the uh, the current offering is Juveau, and the next one is a dermal filler. How is that different? Yeah, so uh, so I, so I mentioned the two biggest categories in in aesthetic uh, uh, medical aesthetics are, are uh, neurotoxins, which again is Botox-like products, and then dermal fillers. Whereas neurotoxins uh, will kind of relax uh, your skin and remove wrinkles. Dermal fillers go in and kind of fill in um, areas. So if you you know if you don't think your lips are, are as plump and kissable as you would like them to be, you can get some dermal fillers to help solve that problem for you. That's just one example. Whereas Botox problem. would remove a wrinkle on your forehead. Okay, got it. Let's move on to golf. Last month, you caught up with Jason Moser to talk about Callaway and a Kushnet, uh, but you actually put your money where your mouth was with a Kushnet. For folks who didn't tune into that segment, can you give a quick refresher on a Kushnet and maybe what makes them different from Top Golf Callaway? Sure, uh, Kushnet is a leading provider of golf equipment. Some of the biggest brands in the game, Titleist, uh, both clubs and balls. Also own Scotty Cameron and putters, Vokey wedges. Also uh, control the the number one shoe in golf uh, with FootJoy. Differentiated uh, from Top Golf Callaway in that a Kushnet is exclusively focused on their golf equipment business, as opposed to Top Golf Callaway, which has diversified their business over the past couple of years, acquiring the top Top golf brand add on to the Callaway business, which is a uh, which, which was the existing golf equipment. Also, a different focus. Uh, Kushnet more focused on, on the dedicated on course golfer, the guy who goes to the country club on a regular basis. T- Top golf Callaway focused on the modern golfer. They actually changed their ticker to Mod G to reflect that different profile uh, of customer they're targeting. Also, would say a different capital allocation approach. You're seeing significant cash being spent by Top Golf Callaway to build out uh, new Top Golf locations, as opposed to a Kushnet, uh, which really is returning significant capital share to shareholders in the form of dividends and buybacks. Yeah, we talk a lot about pandemic tailwinds, and it, it seems like this surprisingly isn't a problem for the golf industry, which had a pretty key advantage over a lot of other places when everything was shut down besides uh, a lot of local golf courses. That's right, and you saw a little bit of weakness in some of these uh, some of these stocks in May with, with Callaway putting out some weaker guidance. Concern that maybe the golf boom uh, was over. However, if you look at results so far this year, golf hanging in nicely year to date. Rounds are up five point five percent year over year in the U.S., and that's continuing a trend that actually was intact pre pandemic. You saw participation bottom out in two thousand seventeen, and we've still been on a growth path. Ever since, uh, worth noting though, we're still about flat from where participation was in the early 2010s. You could argue there's more room to run. I'm kind of on the on that side of the uh, of the argument. Any balance sheet concerns with this company? Looking at a Kushnet, it looks like their accounts receivable more than doubled over the previous quarter. I have to wonder if they're having issues getting paid by their customers. Uh, so, from my perspective, uh, no concerns. If you think about the, the nature of the golf business, it's a seasonal business. Not a lot of sales getting done in in the winter months, and you see that in, in the patterns of of the company. Typically, the first quarter you'll see a big bump up um, in accounts receivable. Again, kind of getting those products out to folks and not seeing sell through yet. You also see a big swing up um, in short term borrowings during those quarters as well. But again, as participation swings up during the the, the big golf season of the summer, uh, this, this is a normal seasonality you'd expect. And finally, you also picked up shares in tobacco company Philip Morris. This is a story, or this is an industry where the story might be changing a little bit. A uh, recent city report says that the tobacco industry is no longer in structural decline, even though fewer people are smoking cigarettes. Uh, what's going on here? Yeah, so uh, you could argue that we're, we're moving from a tobacco a business into a, a nicotine uh, business. If it, it is correct to say that that consumption of cigarettes have declined over the past fifteen plus years, but in that same city report, and other folks have observed this as well. If you take into account things like vaping, uh, nicotine pouches, you know your Zens of the world that are out there in the market, you're seeing actually net consumption of nicotine remain flat to where we were in the two thousand seven uh, level, and you know, is an argument to be made that you could see nicotine consumption swing up. Philip Morris, really the leader in these uh, emerging reduced risk products, acquired Swedish Mattress, the parent company of Zen, um, uh, in the past year or so. That that company has dominant market share in nicotine patches, pouches um, in the U.S. Philip Morris also uh, uh, is one of the leaders in Heat Not Burn products. Their their product Icos is. is 
really dominant in in European markets as well as in Japan. And so, if you think we're we're in this uh, transition period where we're moving from uh, cigarettes as the primary form of nicotine consumption into these other new forms. Philip Morris is a leader um, in that market. With some concerns, lots of uh, you know uh, uh, smaller Chinese competitors, some folks that haven't really complied with FDA regulations remaining on the market. Uh, if we see that enforcement take place, then I expect that you'll see a similar pricing structure in, in this fu- these future nicotine businesses as we've seen in the past. To date, however, Laxinfant has uh, not allowed the same type of uh, of profitability profile as we've seen in the past. However, if things normalize, I think you'll see these products be actually more profitable than cigarettes uh, in the long term. If there's more regulatory risks, there's more standardization in the ways that people consume nicotine, does Philip Morris have pricing power in this in this sort of minefield? Well, it's a question of what the regulatory environment is today. Currently, uh, the, the FDA pre-market tobacco application process, you'll see the PMTA throwing around, is so robust that only really the largest tobacco companies have been able to to get through to the finish line. And uh, to the extent that companies aren't able to get through to the finish line, aren't able to be marketed um, over the long term, which appears to be more likely to see an enforcement ramp up, then we're only going to see a handful of folks really playing in this market. And when you have a business where there's only a handful of folks selling a product where there's extreme brand loyalty, uh, that the history of this industry says that you'll have pricing power, and uh, I expect to see that again. I'll also throw in a quick plug for a, a stock that I recently bought, Nick. Uh, picked up a few shares at Disney. I think there's a lot of reasons to be pessimistic about this company. Uh, park margins are down. Tough to find a profit in streaming. Pixar's had a few flops lately. The succession plan has uh, has had some issues between Bob Iger and Bob Chapek, and then back to Bob Iger. I don't know. I think this is a company that's transformed itself before. I think it has a narrative problem that it can clean up, maybe. And uh, I guess it's also a bet that Iger can clean up some of JPEG's mess. Yeah, listen, if my wife is any indication, she is like the biggest Disney diehard you've ever seen. Uh, There's so many customers out there that have that type of, uh, of love for Disney. They're going to be given lots of opportunities to, to figure out a way to transition, probably more so than many other media companies out there. I'll admit, I, I'm a little bit skeptical with the, some of the struggles they've faced, but you can't argue with the type of brand loyalty that folks have to uh, to that company. And, and, and I think they'll, uh, they'll be given every opportunity to figure things out. Let's hope they do. Nick Seipel, appreciate your time and your insight. Great to be here with you, Ricky. As always, people on the program may own stocks mentioned, and The Motley Fool may have formal recommendations for or against, so don't buy or sell anything based solely on what you hear. I'm Dylan Lewis. Thanks for listening. We'll be back tomorrow.